It's now time for this month's broadcast of Learning Now TV. It's that time again. It's time for Learning Now Television November. Nigel, what have we got on the show today? Yeah, it's November. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be Christmas soon, Kate. Oh, a whole year. <laughs> Bring it on. It's been the longest and quickest year in history. <laughs> it certainly has. It certainly has. And this will be the longest and quickest programme in history because we've got some very, very interesting and entertaining and informative people on. Let me draw attention to three of them. Firstly, to Lisa Johnson from NHS Blood and Transplant. That is a huge organization and she's got them really geared up, shifted the focus to online learning and helped them in their new, more customer facing role. And it's a fascinating story, a really good case study. And then Laurie Niels Hoffman gives us her perspective on the world from her base in Toronto. And then Martin Cousins, Martin is back with a very, very useful summary of contemporary research. So three great people and uh, part of a great program, I think. Hold on to your seat, folks, and enjoy the show. It's a real privilege today to be talking to Lisa Johnson. Lisa is the OD manager, digital and people skills at the NHS blood and transplant operation, I suppose it's called division, whatever, you, you know, whatever Lisa will frame it. It's a huge organization, five and a half thousand staff. And Lisa has been in this role for two years. And what I want to catch up and discuss with her is what has she done in that role and how has the current crisis transformed what she's been doing? So Lisa, first of all, welcome. It's really nice to see you and a pleasure to talk to you again. Tell Thanks, us, Michael. what's the last year been like? Busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that tends to be a stock answer for, for most years, to be honest. But this year has been particularly busy, obviously, with the impact of um, COVID and the fact that I'm working in an organization of five and a half thousand staff, where there are lots of different education teams delivering or who were delivering mainly face-to-face -face training. Um, I've got a small team of the six of us in the digital skills team, and we've been supporting a lot of staff across the organization to help them develop the skills and think about how they could get their face-to-face -face learning online without thinking about taking what they would deliver in the classroom and putting it into a, an online format. So we've been working with them to help them develop basic skills around how to deliver virtual classroom. We've fired up a digital learning network where on a regular basis, we're posting blogs and articles to help them understand what digital learning is, how to do it well, what to be thinking about in terms of your learners, how to read that digital body language when you're not in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've really been pulling together over 15 to 20 years experience in this space and trying to concentrate it into content that will help the staff across the organization that yeah. delivers. It's like, it's like you've, you've been de depositing expertise for the last five years and, and getting interest, and now you've paid it all out in one go. <laughs> Biggest achievement, I, what's the most notable achievement over the last year? Um, I would say my team, because being new into NHS blood and transplant a couple of years ago, the digital literacy was quite low. And the, the trainers that I had, the couple of trainers that I had within the team when I started had come from a classroom based background with an interest in digital learning. So developing a bit of e-learning, developing a few videos. So I, re I realized quickly that um, they needed to go on a huge learning journey. And I was the only person there to take them on that. 
So it was back to grassroots. And I think I'd forgotten more than I remembered at that time. So it was going back to thinking about how did I start in this journey? What kind of training did I go through to, to develop the skills that I needed? And taking that 15, 20 years of, of knowledge that I had and trying to boil that up into something that I could develop, uh, use to develop them. And we spent that first year just focusing on e-learning development, really, understanding the processes of going through to work with subject matter experts, how to put good governance around the work that you were doing, how to run discovery sessions, how to storyboard content, how to apply instructional design techniques and, and how to build it. And then as the we were able to prove ourselves over that first year, we obviously were able to put the business justification forward to grow the team because we'd whetted the appetite of the organisation in terms of what digital learning could offer. So Lisa, you walk in the room, you're greeted by people who want to do 5,000 PowerPoint slides online for three and a half hours and make it mandatory. How do you respond? What guidelines, what standards have you set for the organisation and learning? I remember when I first entered the room with, a, with my very first stakeholder at NHSBT, and I brought the, the two members of the team in with me because as part of their development, I wanted to demonstrate how I operated and how we would work with the stakeholders to be able to ask the right questions in a performance consulting kind of way. And I remember the stakeholder walking into the room and the first thing that they said was, right, I've got my 40, 50 slide, slide deck in PowerPoint. Can I show you it? And I said, no, I don't want to see your, your slide deck. Let's start somewhere else. So the let's help me understand. And I remember looking at the guys in the room and they were a bit like, has she really just said that? But that is what helped, but running through that process, that's what helped them see why it was less important to see that content and more important at that stage and more important to understand what it was that we were, we were trying to achieve. What outcome did that stakeholder need to deliver for the organisation? And what did we need to do to get there? Who did we need to reach? What was the volumes like? So on, which would then help inform what we would need to be able to deliver for them as a team, if anything. And I have pushed back on some things um, and, and taken it from there. That's, I think that's absolutely right. It's, it's framing it for everybody. So not, not accepting what you've given, but framing it so we all see the picture very differently. We all understand it differently. Together, not you imposing, not them imposing, but working it out together. What are the benefits, do you think, to the customers, to the, you've, your five or six people, their five and a half, that, or four, 5,494 people, to be exact. So tell me, what, what, what did they see different? Um, better quality products, uh, more succinct products, a faster pace of development, and the fact that we weren't just holding on to this service, that we were sharing our knowledge and skills with them to empower them to be able to um, do some of this themselves where they could. So with a small team, you're never going to meet everybody's demands. So it's important to be able to, to share that knowledge and widen the expertise across the organisation. So what they saw was, was that knowledge, that sharing, that, that experience and skill being brought into the organisation and a, a trusted, confident and advisor. So I've done a lot of consultancy work over the past couple of years. Um, and people are coming to me daily with just questions and advice around issues or business problems that they might have, where they think that some kind of learning solution may be the answer. And they'll often come to me with one thing and we'll bounce around different ideas and they'll go away with something else. Or they'll come to me and say, we need this, a little bit of a, uh, expected me to be a bit of an order taker. And it's always having those conversations around, well, why do we need this? Help me understand is there a way, better way that we could do this? So, so I think you're, it's that, so that Lisa, not just delivering, yeah. but actually consulting with them on around the best solution for the learner. That was my question. I was going to say, you sound to me like you've shifted role into being a performance consultant, essentially, that you're, you're in, the, in the business 
offering expertise and advice, helping people see how they can solve their own problems rather than you them coming to you and saying, Lisa, give me three of those or Lisa, I'm hopeless and helpless. Do it for me. So you've got that very important. Are you taking your team with you? Are you trying to build a team of performance consultants? Very much so. That's certainly been part of the core focus that I've been using with them in their in their development, because um, they were previously order takers, I guess, build us this e-learning course. Um, but they can see that there's a better way and they don't have to respond to everything with a yes, I can do that, that they can respond to everything a lot of the lines of asking questions and asking the right questions to deeply understand what the requirement is around and where we can help solve that problem. So yeah, they, that's, that's definitely where we are as a team. What would you say when someone says, what's wrong with being an order taker? I know my job, people tell me what to do, I get on and do it, hand it back to them when it's finished, all good. What do you think the advantages of performance consulting are? Not for you, but for the rest of the business. What do you think you, you bring to the business? Well, we could just be churning out content after content after content, but what difference does it make? So the real, um, the real decision is around what impact is this gonna have within the organization? We've got a large number of staff. They're delivering critical frontline services. The biggest risk to them is that they could be, um, that they could fail to save a life if they got it wrong. And so the bigger, the, the real value and benefit is in making, having those discussions and making those right decisions because ultimately there's a high cost at the end of it if we don't get it right. And I guess your approach, you know, you're asking good questions, that is embedded in the person who's answering the question. So they begin to ask better questions of their team and they begin to ask better questions. So you end up with, I guess, what, what you've just said, making better decisions, saving more lives. Yeah, and, and what I've seen is where we get, where we start to work with repeat stakeholders is you see a shift in their approach and their thinking when they're coming back to you for a second time. And that's been really powerful as well and impactful because they've been on that learning journey and we've helped them understand why we're asking these questions and why we want to consult with them in the way that we do. So when they come back for that second piece of work or that third piece of work, they're already coming to us with that change of mindset, which has been brilliant. So to be here for two years and see that shift already taking place has been great. So you're having a real impact on the organisation, which I'm, I congratulate you for. I think that's absolutely wonderful doing that with still a relatively small team in a relatively large organisation. So you've got people listening to this programme thinking, I'd like to get into that. What tips would you give an L&D team wanting to get into performance consulting rather than just taking orders? How would you advise them? What is the way to start this journey? Interesting question, because I haven't done anything formally on this either. It's kind of going to conferences, reading blogs, looking at research, following people that are that, that, are, that talk about performance consulting and just being able to read some of the case studies where the, you can see where organisations have an impact in working in this way. So it, it's that talking to the right people, reading the right material um, and then just jumping in and, and having a go not being too worried about it. I know when I started training a couple of the, the, um, the early team when I joined, it was one of them is trained as an executive coach. And it was just about taking those questioning te techniques that you would use and being able to apply that to the asks that are coming in and the products that you need to build. Do you standardise that? Do you, for example, those questions, do you share those questions, the key questions, the entry questions, the closing questions? Do you, do you do that or is it just basically as the relationships develop individually? It's quite hard, I think, because the dynamic in the room, the dynamic with the stakeholders that you're working with and the, the products that you're looking at can be different every single time. So other than starting with help me understand, I, there's nothing else scripted. It just spins off the back of that and you end up with a room full of post-it pads or you're used to um, that you could then start organising into some kind of solution. Now, of course, we've had to switch to doing that online. So we're looking at, um, we've been using online tools to do that particular process and chunking it up much more so that it's more manageable when we're, we're working with the SMEs because it seems to be much more tiring doing it online. 
It is, it is more Thankfully. tiring. It, it's actually true. That's not just a perception. It's because our brains aren't... It, it, imagine that you're a three-dimensional figure in front of me, but you're actually a two-dimensional bunch of pixels. So my brain is finding it very hard to work it all out and, and turn two dimensions into three dimensions. So it is harder. So that's a really good place to start. So the, the, the opening question, the opening question is the critical question. What's your problem? Yeah. 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 And, and we begin from that. Okay, Lisa Johnson, it's really been excellent to talk to you. It's been a great journey you've been on. And it's fantastic to celebrate the kind of impact that you're making on an organization that is pretty fundamental for all of us in different ways around the country. So Lisa, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nigel. I'm proud to do my bit. And Robin is back. He never runs out of topics to talk about. It's actually amazing. And this time he's on about presentations and particularly about slides. And he's going to argue that you should never give out your slides before a presentation, never during the presentation, and never after the presentation. So see whether you agree with him. Anyway, welcome Robin. There was an interesting Twitter exchange last week uh, about webinars and, and people using video conferencing tools in order to run short sessions, etc. And it went along the lines of, oh, only two seconds in and somebody's already asked if the slides are going to be available at the end. And somebody commented, which was, oh, yeah, well, this is really good practice. We need to make the slides available and a recording and we should announce that right at the start of the session. And I thought about that for a moment. And actually, I'm not sure I agree with that. And I think there are a couple of reasons. The first is, one is around intellectual property and the fact that actually, as a trainer, as somebody who does work within this sector, the content of those slides is my bread and butter. And very often, I'm being asked to do these webinars, as I'm sure many of you are, for no money. So if we're speaking to an external audience, I think the expectation that we should make available the slides, etc., immediately afterwards is a bit rich, actually. And I think we should be able to protect what we've got. And that extends to the fact that when we give people slides, very often those slides will then be used. And it's bad enough that we've already got people around organisations who think because they can create a PowerPoint slide, they are instantly a trainer. If we're now not even relying on them to create their own PowerPoint slides, but we're giving them them, then we're unleashing people with no quality control whatsoever onto unsuspecting audiences who could take what we've said out of context, change things around, twist things, add things in which would be contradictory to what we've said elsewhere, etc etc so i'm nervous about it from that perspective but there's a more prosaic reason why i think it's not a good idea as well if you give somebody the slides after any presentation not just a webinar or something which is delivered via video conference then that changes the nature of those slides they move from being purely a visual aid to being what sometimes is referred to as a slidement. And typically what that means is we put all of the content onto the slide. We put that in text, we put that in bullet point form, we've got loads of words on the slides because they are being written for a dual purpose. They're being created not only to support what we are saying during our presentation, but also as some kind of handout. So what I do is I say, actually, sorry, no, you can't have the slides at the end of the presentation. What I will do, though, is I will create a report or an article or a reading list 
or something which says these are the key points and it will be written specifically to be used as a handout or a takeaway from the session. And that way we're not necessarily compromising the quality of the slides used within the presentation. We're giving people something that they can use. And we can also, of course, then put all over that document that this should be used with appropriate attribution. So we're also dealing with some of my concerns from the first part, which is around the use of intellectual property. So slides are for presentations. They are there as a visual aid to support what the speaker is saying. They are not handouts please, please, please resist attempts to get them to be used in that way. DPG's online courses are designed to fit around your life, so you can study anytime, anywhere. Get in touch now for more info. Martin Cousins is back with another fascinating report for us to review. This time it's CLO Magazine in a report, piece of research sponsored by Adobe. Uh, it's on the COVID crisis. I think we've seen one or two reports I seem to remember about that. But this is interesting. Why is this one interesting, Martin? What drew your attention to it? Well, Nigel, I have to admit, I can't get enough of the COVID research um, only because it shows that there's, everything's changed and I don't think there's any going back for L&D in terms of what it was to what it is becoming. And if we need evidence of that, then there's plenty of it and I would hold on to it tightly if you ever need to make the case for some of these changes. If you are still in a, a, an L&D team that is in crisis mode, then actually a lot of this research is beginning to show the, A, the direction of travel, the way teams are responding. And, you know, it, it's there to make the case that learning has become or is becoming a digital first function. I, I, think that. that's, I think that's a very important point, Martin, that, that a lot of this research is interesting in itself, but it, it creates an armory for those who are under pressure, an armory of evidence to present, because there's 731 organisations being surveyed in this report. That's quite a large number of organisations, big and small. So when you come in with your armory, you've got some pretty strong evidence of what's actually happening? I think so. I mean, I would say this because, you know, we do this slot together on Learning Now TV, but we do talk about an evidence base and why evidence and data is important in learning. And I would definitely be pointing to some of these research reports on COVID because this is new territory. So these reports are charting uncharted territories <laughs> if you see what i mean so I it, it gives a good sense of where we're heading so this this report uh, it you know not surprisingly talks about the shift to digital but there are a couple of things in it that i think are probably worth highlighting firstly the, the types of topics that l d are supporting and enabling in terms of what, what activities what topics are their activities supporting? And the other thing is some of the challenges for learners through lockdown, because I think they're, that's quite telling and, that, and that's kind of shaping what learning teams need to be doing. So in terms of the topics, soft skills is the number one area that L&D is supporting currently. And I think that's quite interesting. I know other reports are talking about well-being, but in this report, it's soft skills, and then it's leadership development, then it's technical skills, compliance, and reskilling and upskilling. So soft skills are the number one area of development for a lot of organizations. Now, that surprises me. Does that surprise you? Not 
really, because what, I, what I've been banging on about is that we need to equip people to think faster, be able to adjust quicker, and to cope with disruption and uncertainty. And those soft, they call them soft skills, I call them generative skills. Uh, I think Burson calls them power skills. But they're the skills that allow you to learn other stuff effectively and efficiently. So I think that as, as a result of, I suppose, the lack of resilience in some organizations, it's a way of encouraging and, uh, and building increased resilience in organizations. So from that point of view, I'm not surprised. And I'm not surprised that leadership has become a big issue because we've seen some pretty mm. dreadful examples of appalling leadership in the face of this crisis with leaders trying to kind of keep a lid on everything and push everything back to the way it was, which is just never going to happen. So that doesn't surprise me that organizations are seeing where they're struggling and trying to learning is trying to address those issues first or primarily. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, you know, so soft skills, I think that's a very positive sign. I think leadership development's an interesting one because I don't think anyone's written the book yet on what leadership development looks like when it's digital first or digital only. Um, so let's see how that pans out. I think, you know, I think hopefully there'll be lots more insight around what that looks like and what successful digital leadership development will look like. Um, so I thought that was one area, just the topics. I think that's a reflection of where organizations are at and, and soft skills have risen to the top. And I think the other area is that I thought was quite interesting was the greatest challenges for learners during the crisis. Now, if we take a kind of employee or learner first approach where the you know, demand is being generated at that level, and l and d is supporting that demand, then here we have the top five, which are areas which are technical, and that means connectivity and access, um, family, child care and caring for older members of the family, lack of time, I thought that was very interesting, um, mental health which I think that's been reasonably well documented um, and lack of resources. So actually that whole area of being able to work effectively remotely has, you know, maybe that's unsurprising, but has that gone away? Are we going to get really good at that? Let's hope so. But I think that is definitely on L and D's watch now and into the future. I think so, and the, the, the statistics are amazing. That things like technical connectivity issues, sixty-four percent, family, childcare, children, all of that stuff, fifty-eight percent. These are not just minor problems for a few people; they're major problems yeah. for a lot of people. So, yeah, I agree. I think this puts it firmly in the in the court of L and D to try and help support and if not resolve then at least ameliorate some of these issues you're quite right martin so this is a good report let's can i just repeat the title for for everybody it's called 2020 report learning during the global crisis how l d departments are navigating their workforce through the covid 19 pandemic from chief learning officer magazine a free download and as I say, based on 731 respondents, you agree worth reading, Martin? Absolutely. And if not, just add it to your, as you said, your armory of evidence about how things are changing for learning. Yes. Martin, thank you very much.
Dr. Hannah Gore joins us once again for the second part of her five part series on engaging conversations. Let's hear what she has to say. Hi everyone, it's Dr. Hannah Gore again from the Canterbury Consultancy Group and welcome to episode number two in Engaging Conversations. Now last episode we looked at um, engaging conversations with stakeholders and identifying your stakeholders. But what is it that they're actually going to be engaging with? Now, with the advent of COVID, a number of us have had to move to the world of online, which is new and different because we've been used to face to face learning. I personally have been working on online learning for 15 years. And during that time, I've seen a number of different changes in how online content is delivered and digested. So question is where to begin now. First of all, hats off to you for making it this far because it was a massive shock to a number of us around the world when we suddenly had to go into lockdown. It was not something that we had prepared for inside our risk analysis. So if you've got content up online, fantastic. First of all, that's very important. But now we're getting into the kind of what next phase now that we're past sticking plaster. So what does it mean for your content now? Well, wow, this is very important because the knee jerk reaction was to get everything up online. And that may have been using SharePoint, a cloud drive system, um, folders inside your structure, inside your organization. But that is not how learners will engage long term. That is not where stakeholders will be interested. So how do you make your content more interesting, more engaging? Well, first thing you do is think about yourself as the most disengaged learner that there is. I've been designing content for 20 years. And during that time, I have played the role personally of the most disengaged learner. I am probably one of the most motivated people that there is about learning, but I need to think about the learner that does not want to do it. That will help shape your design enormously. They are looking for their critical path. So first of all, break down the content. If you've decided to replace a half day workshop with a half day webinar, don't do it. Do not do it. It is too long. If you sat in front of the computer for hour after hour after hour of video conferencing, you know it's exhausting, it's tiring, your eyes really hurt, and after a while, you just can't engage. You're just not concentrating. It'll be the same for your learners, but they're not just listening to dialogue inside a meeting, they're actually trying to learn content. So number one, break down the content no longer have these big designs, bite-sized chunks, number one. Number two, every single bite-sized chunk that they create, make sure you have a takeaway, a PDF, a one-pager, a snapshot, a key valuable point. This helps them achieve their learning outcomes. So if, for example, you're teaching them about the art of negotiation, then teach them in a take-home the five stages of negotiation. This is the part that they will memorize and use within the workplace. Also, think about the types of platforms available out there. Now, you could continue using something as SharePoint if you do not have the capacity within your organization. It's not ideal, but there's also nothing wrong with it as long as you make it engaging. So think about the file structures, the navigation, how the learners are gonna find content, how you're mapping out the content within. So once they get into the folder, they find the file that they need, and then what is the learning outcome? So think about how you're grouping them. Think about the titling. It is much easier to have part one, part two, part three, part four. Program one, program two, program three, program four. So think about that. Don't just give them all titles without thinking about the type of journey that the learner is gonna take through the content. And then enhance it. Can you use Teams, Zoom, etc. on top? Now, when I worked at Solera Holdings, I advocated heavily the art of flipped classrooms. There is a uh, blog pieces about this on my blog over at drhannagore.com, so do take a look. But in the art of flipped classroom, what it actually looks at is learning the content online and then doing a face-to-face -face element. So for example, instead of just teaching people how to present by putting them in front of somebody who's presenting to them, teach them the art of presentation first how to storyboard, how to build rapport, how to structure a document, how to practice it, and then take them through to a face-to-face -face element. This is very, very crucial. When I worked at the Open University, 
this is what they call practice-based learning. You practice it, practice it, practice it, you will learn it. If you learn it in isolation, say for example, if I read an accountancy book, it does not make me an accountant, but if I practice hard enough, maybe one day I'll be able to actually pass my accountancy exams. And that's the difference. So consider the use of Teams, Zoom, etc., as an enhancement on top of the online learning. Also as well, look at boards such as Trello. They are absolutely fantastic. I personally like them for planning out learning design, for planning out content, using the different cards and lists to map out what I think a learning structure will look like. That is a free tool, so go ahead and use it. Absolutely fantastic way of planning out programs and then signposting by inserting and embedding links in to the content. So if you have content everywhere, use a Trello board to map out your design. Now you can then share that with the learners or you can keep it to yourself. I personally like to share them. Also as well, use a Trello board as a pin board. Get your staff, your learners to tell you and pin on the different cards what they have found interesting in learning, what they have seen elsewhere and start sharing the learning. Not all learning has to be directed from us. This then starts to develop a really important learning culture within your organisation. So to consider that as well. Consider how all learning does not have to come from you and you can build a community of a learning culture inside your organisation. And then of course, spend time with your learners and understand, are they actually liking it? Do they Have they seen anything elsewhere? Do they want it in a different way? So spend your time thinking about if you really didn't want to learn, what are the key things that you need to make you learn? to make it easier to navigate, to make it easier to digest, to make it easier to practice inside the workplace. That's who we are designing for. So there's a lot in there. There's a lot of different articles inside my blog, Dr. Hannah Gore, if you want to go over and take a look. Please do drop me a line if you want to discuss further. I'm always happy to have a learning conversation. And in the meantime, take care and stay safe. See you all soon. Our learning experiences unlock potential, transform the performance of people and organisations and help millions around the world build happy and successful careers. We change lives with evidence-based learning that works, sparking real change for real impact. It's always a pleasure to talk to my very dear friend, Laurie Niles Hoffman. And I wanted to chat to her first of all about life in Canada. She's based in Toronto. Usually she's on a plane three times a week. And just like me, she's not been on a plane three times a week or even once a month in the last several months. So Laurie, just give us a, a snapshot. How is life in Toronto? How's it going? How do you feel? Is everyone well in your family? Thank you so much for asking. And it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Nigel. Um, just just wonderful, thank you. We're doing well. Um, it's, it's, the situation is, is demanding. Um, I'm unable to see my parents. I'm unable to leave Toronto, the greater Toronto area. Um, in, in terms of job losses here, we are seeing that being impacted. Um, nobody's going into the city. Um, and I've actually, interestingly enough, I've had five of my close friends who've moved. So the real estate market is actually doing quite well. People are moving out of the city. So we're yeah. seeing all sorts of different shifts happening. Happening. And unlike the UK, we are a very large country, but not very populated. Um, so we're seeing some real challenges with people getting access to Wi-Fi. And, you know, some people are on just a 3G network, if not even less. So lots of different things that we didn't think would, would, would happen are now coming to, coming to the forefront. So it's, it's a chance to really get the infrastructure booted up. It's, it's revealed holes in the infrastructure, which will be fixed, I guess. All these things are fixable. Absolutely. So just one of the things I was interested in was your commitment to working with people in learning who've mm -hmm. lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. What are you doing? How are you helping people? So one of the things that we, we decided at the very beginning of the pandemic was 
what can we do to help? Let's just put things on pause from a business perspective. And, and what can we do? Because it, it impacts all of us. And we were seeing so many people come up with, you know, uh, open to work, you know, the logo on LinkedIn. So first few things we did were offer some free webinars. And those are still, still available um, on, on my blog. And it really was advice from, I'm old. <laughs> I've been through three recessions. And we see patterns that happen in L&D. And they, they, they tend to repeat. So going into this one, what were the things that we learned in those previous ones that kept us ahead of the curve? Because that's that's going to be the most important thing. L&D professionals right now, if they're they're you know digging into you know how do I upskill just to convert learning to digital, that's only going to get you so far, and and that's you're going to have a really short lifespan. So we've been actively trying to get the word out on really specific ways, like we detail about eight of them that you can future proof yourself and make yourself more marketable for as this things start to improve and as you're job hunting. The other thing we've been doing is mentoring a lot on an individual basis. We've opened up our networks. We opened up all of our resources that we normally keep proprietary for, for clients. That's all available. Um, just so, uh, you know, trying to give as much as possible. And none of this is, you, you have to live in the greater Toronto area. This is, this is, you're offering this to anybody who will find it useful. And a lot of the stuff is generic. You know, nothing much changes whether you're in Canada or in the UK or, or Spain or anywhere else in the world. Absolutely not. And even when we did the webinar, because we know there's sensitivity around people acknowledging that they're, you know, possibly out of work, um, put in a fake name, I don't care, Daffy Duck, Mickey Mouse, we we're not looking at any of that. Um, it's more just getting the content uh, out, out to people. And helping people, yeah. yeah. And give, kind of giving people hope, because the, the great thing that you can do in those circumstances is give people a feeling that there's a pathway ahead of them. It's not just a brick wall ahead of them. And if you can do that, that is massively helpful, because psychologically they can begin to sort themselves out. Completely. And give people actions that they can take. We have been in the, these scenarios before. I mean, I remember 9-11. I remember 2008 and dot-com, you know, uh, bust. We it, it follows a pattern. And once you understand that pattern, you can say, OK, I, I can prepare myself for this and I can make it make it through. And it is definitely, definitely doable. Yeah, I, I think that's a very positive message. Um, we'll put a link on the screen so that anyone who wants to follow through on this information will just write down that link and click on it and the information is freely available. So what else is happening? Tell me some projects that you're involved with, some interesting stuff going on in your world. Yeah, so we've been doing um, some some uh, really interesting work, in particular in, in pharmaceuticals. And one of the projects um, I, I can't name because pharma right now is a very uh, competitive arena. But what was really interesting, it was a group of engineers who wanted to rapidly upskill uh, oil and gas engineers who are losing jobs into becoming pharmaceutical automation engineers. So this is going to be one of the big gaps for producing a vaccine. We actually have a few pharmaceutical clients, and what we hear from them is science for the vaccine can be developed. How will we manufacture this? We don't, they don't have the people who are upskilled enough in order to do this. And this is what these engineers were trying to tackle. They're saying, okay, we can build a factory. Who runs that factory? Who knows how to do all the safety and controls and manage it? And that is a, a complete gap. So we were helping uh, with them. So how do they then partner with the oil and gas industries? How do we help them build an ecosystem so that that learning can happen? What are the best ways you know, to, to, to get it out there? Um, so that was probably the, the project that we were most interested in. It wasn't our largest, but it was just so, it felt like we were really tackling um, some, some real, uh, real problems which were which were great um, a second one uh, was one that we only helped a little bit but it was uh, I, I urge everyone to have a look at it was with Santa labs and what they did is if you haven't heard about it, you're nodding it was, it was a great project where they you know looked at furloughed airline employees and know that they are trained as first responders and how do they rapidly put them into healthcare scenarios um, and that was a, a really interesting, uh, interesting one to to work on. So, so those have been 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 two. And then there's always the day to day, you know, the the ed tech transformations, which are what we, you know, we 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 do for our clients, and and, and those are fun too. Yeah, it's it's all of that stuff is where you're acting as a a kind of smart intermediary in a way that that you're putting A with B and saying if you did it this way, you'll get 
better results or more results and just exciting people to the possibilities rather than uh, this, this is all bad. It's actually quite hopeful because, and to be able to move people around so that their skills are retained and their, their commitment and their, and their service is also retained is an, is a really useful thing. And that's going to have to happen more and more in our world. And so that I think you've got a job for life, Laurie. I don't think it's, <laughs> It's going to disappear. But tell me about learning campaigns, because that's another interesting topic we've talked about before. You've been helping with designing, thinking through and engaging with learning campaigns. So just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the story I always tell uh, very quickly when people talk about campaigns is, is ironically about uh, toilet paper roll, um, which <laughs> I was not hoarding. But it's the idea that I go to a store once a week by my loyalty card, it knows how many times I go. It probably has predicted how many people are in my household. It knows the last time that I, I bought toilet paper roll. And it knows my pattern, my, my day and all that. So one Saturday, I was walking there with my husband. I got a notification on my phone and it said, here is a coupon for $3 off. Now, that seems really, you know, creepy in a way, but on the other hand, I'm cheap and I'm really glad to save money on toilet paper. It's my Polish sensibility there. But what it was doing is it was pulling data about all the things that I had been doing and it was giving me, serving me up content at the point of need. So how does that work with, with learning? Well, if I'm in, in uh, say, for example, I just completed my level four Spanish. What if it comes up and says, hey, would you actually like to do your time entry in Spanish? Do you want to try? Do you want to, or here's, you know, uh, a, a, an article, for, you know, in Spanish that gets surfaced up into my, you know, my learning experience platform feed. So it's starting to pull all those pieces and it's looking at, we moved a lot, thanks to Nick Shackleton Jones from courses to resources, but we also have to think very intelligently about how those resources fit together, how they build, how they fit into somebody's day-to-day -day work, and using other pieces of data to triangulate where that where that belongs. So that's it's 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 quite an art. There are places to learn it. Um, I go back to, you know, 12 years ago, I was at a company called Eloqua and they were part of the marketing automation. And that's where a lot of this thinking starts, but we can't be marketers. Marketers are, are doing, gonna give you what you want, not what you need. Learning is what you need. And that's a very different algorithm. It's a very different experience, but we can be inspired. Um, by some of the work that 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 they do. Um, but it's really about taking a user centric approach and thinking of all of those pieces and how we get them along to a final skills acquisition. Yes, I agree with you entirely. And I, I think that that is the way forward, isn't it? That 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 is in, in five years time, we'll look back and think, what on earth was this a, a, a challenge? This is the obvious way to do things at the point of need, integrated entirely in work, and not just pushed down your throat, but just made available for you at a point where you may accept the challenge. But ultimately, you're the one who makes those decisions. I think that's very, very interesting. So all of that, so let's just, just recap, Laurie. We, we talked about help with people whose jobs have disappeared and just giving them some hope and some direction and preparation for the future. We talked about that ability to reskill large groups of people who, whose jobs for no good reason, not, nothing certainly to do with them. The, the market has shifted, but to repurpose them, still using their skills, but into areas that are growing and where need can't be met, particularly in pharma, we, we talked about. And then finally, this idea of learning campaigns, learning aimed at the individual at the moment of need, entirely geared to them based on a knowledge of where they are, where they're coming from and where they're going. All of those three things kind of add together, don't they? They all add up and it's all about, it's all about purpose and focus and delivering things that are uh, appropriate at the moment. And you're very much working at a number of moments in a number of places, but nevertheless, at the moment. Laura, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And that was a fascinating Likewise. conversation. Thank you so I much. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. In the 
L&D world, we all know our biggest challenge is knowledge fade and demonstrating ROI from our training interventions. At Elephants Don't Forget, we use artificial intelligence to guarantee that what you train your employees, they learn and retain. If you are looking to transform the impact your training content has in your business, improve the ROI, and perhaps help employees learn and retain even the dull regulatory material, drop me a line at nelly at elephantsdon'tforget.com. Well, that was a good program, didn't it? Whisked, it did whisk by, just as we predicted it would at the beginning, Kate. What was your highlight? What did you really enjoy? Uh, Johnson is somebody that I've known for a long time and always, just always delivers, you know, and she's worked in organisations like a charity, like the NHS, where it can be tough to bring about digital transformation. You know, the budget set can be tight and, you know, a lot of staff might have been doing their roles in a very traditional capacity for a long time. So just to hear her story come to light now, she's been there for a few years and done the work, laid the foundations, just super inspiring. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've watched her, you know, over many years and she's growing bigger in stature and being so much more confident about really changing organizations as opposed to, you know, tinkering around the edges. So she's right at the heart of NHS blood and transport uh, transplant. So well done, Lee. So good luck to you. And I always find it interesting listening to perspectives beyond our shores. We should do as much of that as possible to give us a bit of perspective. Stop getting too obsessed with ourselves in our little worlds. And Laurie does that in spades. So I really enjoyed that talk as well. Always, always delivers. Always worth listening to what Laurie has to say, 100%. I agree with you. So we've got a newsletter, Kate. What is that about? Yeah, so we thought it would be nice to be able to reach out to people and um, kind of you know, live by the words that we preach. So curate some of our, our archive and some of our um, back catalogue. You know, we pack these shows out twice a month now. Um, so we, it's nice to be able to remind people of some of the key interviews that they might have missed and also just do the news roundup. So we get people sending us things all the time, letting us know what's going on around events and other industry activities. So the newsletter now is a way of curating that and getting that out to people so we have sent our first one out if you didn't receive it just let us know um, check your junk mail just in case but um, look out for more of those in the future hopefully a useful resource for people going forward and there are some events let's just uh, talk about them. we've got four the first one to share with you is learning 2020 and that takes place next week uh, I think you can still sign up for it I'm doing a session next week on it and it seems to have got a large amount of interest and there's some very, very good speakers and it's completely free. So please check it out. What else yep. have we got? If you've never made it to Florida like me for the for the live event, then you'll be looking at uh, attending online, I, I don't doubt. So Online Educa Berlin, our friends over at Closer Still are running that on the 30th of November to the 4th of December, also online. Um, and there's a, a well-being event, Nigel, as well. Yeah, CIPD, 2nd of December, a one-day um, well-being at work event run by CIPD. Should sign up for that. And then finally, let's jump to next June when the world may be a little bit different. What's happening on 9th to 10th of June 2021, Kate? Well, with good luck and a following wind and a vaccine, uh, we are looking at learning technologies having from its February slot to the 9th and 10th of June at London's Excel. But stay tuned because we'll bring it to you as soon as we have news of what they are planning for February. There's hopefully some online activity being planned for then. Well, that's all from us for this uh, part of the month. We'll be back later on in November for the second instalment. And there's lots of good stuff lined up for that as well. I promise you. Join bye, us Kate. on the 26th. Yeah, bye-bye. Good to see you again. Take care, Kate. Bye-bye.